days of the four Sundays before Christmas, okay? And what we talked about last week was the first candle, and the first candle represented hope. Everybody say hope. hope. See, as long as an individual has hope, they can get through virtually any storm in life if you have hope. Why? Because they know that even no, you're going through a storm there will be calm I'm telling you if you and I take hope away from a situation we cannot get through it okay and sometimes I don't know about you but I bet you some of you are just like me sometimes the only hope you had when you were getting through a storm was there was going to be a calm at the other end and you know what? As long as you and I have that hope, we can get through that. So this morning, then we're going to look at the second purple candle. And the second candle is known as the Bethlehem candle or the candle of love. Okay? Why Bethlehem? Because that was the place where God's love was manifested into the world in the form of Jesus. And one of my favorite names for Jesus is Emmanuel. Everybody say Emmanuel. I, you know, I love the word Emmanuel because Emmanuel actually means God with us. I don't know about anything else in life, but that's what separates our faith from all the other faiths in all the world is God is with us and God is in us. And I think that's really, really important. And I don't know about you, but you know, that will get me through life if I know God is with me, okay? I want us to go over to John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And I think many of us are familiar with it, but let's just read it again. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, you know what? Jesus came into the world that first time not to condemn, but to love people. That's what we're talking about, the, the Bethlehem candle or the candle of love. So we're, knowing how, we're starting to know a little about God's heart for you and I. See, you've heard me say this before, but God is crazy in love for you. Okay? You know, as I told you, when I grew up as a kid, the church I attended, I thought God was mad at me all the time. I didn't think God loved me. I thought God was angry with me. And I needed to know that God loved me. And we're going to talk about that candle today. Because I don't care what you and I do. I don't care what you and I say. Maybe God doesn't like the things we might say or do. But God always loves me. Turn to your neighbor and say, God always loves you. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. Okay? See, God always loves you. And that's very important. That first Christmas was not so much about getting, but the first Christmas was about giving. And if we want to make an impact on others, we need to have that same spirit. See, it, I love Christmas because it's really not about getting. Who here needs another tie? Who here needs another sweater? Who here needs any more dishes? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> okay, that's our little running joke. I told my wife, I said, you know when we were moving? No more dishes. Okay, hallelujah, okay. We got enough dishes for Jesus to feed the 5,000 and still have some left over, hallelujah, okay. But the fact of the matter is the first Christmas was really about giving. It wasn't about getting. And I think you and I realize in life as we get a little older, you know what makes Christmas so special for us? Is when we can give thanks to our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids and we see the joy on top of them. See, we really don't need anything else, but we love giving. And that's what made that first Christmas so important. See, the Bethlehem candle or the candle love shows us that love has the interest of others first and foremost, and not our own selves. See, that's what love's about. Love is being sacrificial. Love is saying, you know what? I don't care about me. I care about you first. See, love wants to enrich. Love wants to empower. And love wants to lift up those around us to places they can never be. You know what? Because somebody loved me. You know, I, my grandmother, Annie, I loved her so much. But she believed in me and spoke such wonderful things over me that she was able to lift me up to places I could have never got by myself. See, that's what love is all about. Lifting people up, okay? Love rejoices when other people succeed. Have you ever had somebody succeed and you weren't that happy for them? I, I, I'll tell a story on Marilyn and I, and it's so true in life. 
when we were at or when I was at Oral Roberts University, and like I said, we had a '63 Ford Fairlane. Oh my goodness! It tried to drive by every junkyard we went by. It tried to pull in. Okay, it really did. Okay. <laughs> And I remember, we're believing God for a new car, or just a different car, maybe a car from this century, okay, you know what I'm saying? And I remember, you know, so we, there we are, you know, we're, we're poor as church mice, but we're believing God for a different car. And I'll never forget, we went to church and somebody got up, and they said, I just want to thank Jesus that God gave us a car. And I taught news for you, I wasn't real happy for him, hallelujah, okay? <laughs> no. No, I really did. I mean, honestly, I thought they stole my car. Okay, you know, I really, has anybody ever felt that way before? You know, I mean, and then all of a sudden, the Lord pricked my heart and said, Jeff, you got to be happy for them. Because you know what? You don't know what they were believing for. You don't know what they've gone through. And so I had to be happy for them. And that was, that was hard. I'm being honest with you. But see, love rejoices when other people succeed. Because you know what we know? God has more than enough. Just because he meets your need doesn't mean he doesn't have enough to meet my need. And that's really, really important. See, that first Christmas when Jesus was born, that is exactly what Jesus did for the world that could not help themselves because of the tentacles of slavery of sin, okay? Because the cords of sin that held you and I down. And you know what? We weren't going to be the people he created us to be. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You know, when Jesus came and when Jesus had a vision, he had a vision in 2018 of you and I standing or sitting here in the church worshiping him and just singing praises to him. But we couldn't if Jesus wouldn't have come for us. Because the tentacles of slavery and the cords of sin were holding us down. But he said, I'm going to love you enough to die on the cross to release you from the tentacles of sin and slavery so you can worship me. That's love. Hallelujah. That's love. Okay? Love didn't see us. Love doesn't see us in the present tense. Love sees us in the future tense. See, when Jesus saw us when he went to the cross, we were bound in slavery. We were confused. We weren't looking good in life. But you know what he did? Jesus looked beyond all this and he saw you and I, as the Bible says, were seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God the Father. See, that's what love does. Love is visionary. Love is saying, I don't see you how you are. I see your potential and how you can be. And that's why we all need somebody to love us. Amen. We all need someone to believe in us that says, you know what? You can achieve higher goals than you think in life. Okay? Because someone is believing in you. Okay? Love is not mere words though. Love also includes actions. And one translation for Christmas actually says it's Christ, Christ sent. See, Christmas is Christ sent. That was love. See, God could have told us he loved us all he wanted. But you know what? If he wasn't going to put any actions to his word, then words are cheap. Amen? How many times we told people, you know what? Don't tell me you love me. Show me you love me. Because words aren't always the right things to say at that moment, okay? Christmas is the time of the year when we see actions truly do speak louder than words. What makes Christmas so special, and I love this, is that saint and sinner like, you know what? They're acting like Jesus in action. You know what's amazing? The most grumpy people in the world, they love Christmas many times. I love it Christmas because that's when saints and sinners are like, you know what they're doing? They're giving. You pe see people that are old Scrooges most of the year, maybe they're going out and they're buying something for their grandkids or they're buying somebody for a nephew or a niece and they get caught in the spirit of giving. See, Christmas is all about giving. It's not getting. And I think that's what I love Christmas, why I love Christmas the most. You can get out there and everybody alike, saint and sinner, has that spirit of giving within them. They're in action. See, it's, only one, it's, it's one thing to say you love someone. It's quite another thing to show them that you love them. At Christmas, God let his actions speak for themselves. And as a result of those actions, Jesus came to earth in the form of a baby that was born in Bethlehem. And you know what? From that night, the direction of the world has changed. Let's go over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John is one of those little books in the very back of your Bible, okay? 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and we're going to read in 1st John chapter 4, and we're going to read several verses here to, this morning. And 1st John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7. This is about love. Beloved, let us, not, let us love one another, for the love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifest towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or our covering for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in, that, in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves uh, torment, but, we, but, he who love, he, but he who fears has not, been, has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Loved us. Now look what verse 20 says. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, you know what, folks? Verse, these verses here in 1 John are saying a lot. It's telling us, let's not say we love God if we can't even love our brother, our person next to us. Because if we can say we are going to love God whom we can't see, and you say, I can't love the person I can see, God says, you know what? You're a liar. You're a liar. This love thing can really get on your nerves sometimes. I want you to know that, okay? See, 1 John chapter 4 is telling us it is inconsistent at best and false outrightly the claim that we love God and we don't obey him. See, if we say we love God, what are we going to do? We're going to obey the Lord. Because what did he say? Words are cheap. Actions prove what we really love. Anybody that's ever been married in life knows this. You can tell your spouse all you want you love them, but if you don't show it in action, they'll never believe it. Okay? It's very, very important that we show our spouse that we love them. We just don't tell them that we love them. This infinite love of God for man is difficult for you and I to comprehend. You know why? Because it doesn't depend upon us. See, God is going to love you no matter what you say and do. See, you and I, you know what our love is based upon? How people treat us. I love you because you love me. I'm nice to you because you're nice to me. And God says, you know what? I'm going to love you regardless of what you say and what you do. I'm going to love you regardless of how you act. And we have a difficult time with that. Because our love many times is conditional. And God's love is unconditional. It doesn't mean that God wants us to act like the devil. It doesn't mean that God wants us to talk like a drunken sailor. And none of those things in life. But he's saying, I'm going to love you regardless of what you do. Okay? See, like any gift, love, it can be received or it can be rejected. It can be used for your everyday life. Or you can put it up on a shelf like a trophy. You know what I think God wants our love to look like? Our love should be battered and bruised. Our love should be tarnished. You know why? Because we're using it on an everyday basis. Let's not take the love of God and put it up on a, on a, on a, on a shelf in our life and say, you know, we're a Christian. No. You know what? I think our love should be battered and bruised because it's out in the everyday world world. And I think it's important. See, God's love for you and I is stronger than any situation you and I will ever get in. And it will outlast any situation we'll ever find ourselves in. You might say, Pastor Jeff, you don't understand what situation I'm in today. You know what? I may not, but I'll tell you what, God's love will outlast it. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't know, but God's love will outlast it. Say that God's love will outlast anything. 
See, God's love will. And we need to realize that in life, okay? God's love is stronger. Why do we find it so difficult to believe and enjoy? Because you know why? I don't know about you, but I know about me. I'm a sinful person. And you know what? And we tend to love people on what they've done or haven't done to us. And God comes along and says, I'm going to regardless, I'm going to love you regardless of what you've done or what you've not done for me. And that's why. See, we're also prone, I don't know about you, but we're prone to be vengeful and we hold grudges, okay? If things don't turn out for our betterment. You know, how many times people really don't give Christmas gifts that maybe a better word would be they exchange. Because what happens if you bought somebody a Christmas gift and they decide not to give you one back? Some of you might think, well, you know what? I'm not going to give them anything next year. Well, then you and I really didn't give them anything, did we? We didn't give them a gift. Because a gift is saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you something. And if you don't give me anything back in return, I'm okay with it in life. And see, that's that unconditional love. Why do I enjoy, what do I enjoy about Christmas? It's a story about a conscious, dedicated, sacrificial act of love to, by God to us. That's why I love Christmas. God made a conscious act dedicated, sacrificial act to say, I'm going to love Jeffrey Joe Peters with all of his warts. I'm going to love him even when he disappoints me. That's why I love Christmas. It explains to me about the love of Jesus for me. See, God's love can't be earned or deserved. You know what God's love is? Think about this. God's love is a gift from the Almighty God. I want you to think about that. God's gift, is, God's love is a gift from the almighty God. God knows what you and I did last night. Really? Yeah, he does. Hallelujah. God knows what you and I did two weeks ago. And despite that, the almighty says, I'm going to give you my gift of love. Why? It's an invitation from a father that says, you know what? There's room for me and my family. See, God wants us to be part of his family. How can we experience his love and joy of Christ? By allowing the story of Christmas become an everyday life experience for us. Let's not relegate Christmas to just a few weeks out of the year. See, God wants his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, what? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, God wants Christmas, that story of Christmas, to be involved in our lives all the time. The story and the spirit of Christmas can't stop with us. We must allow this spirit of Christmas to be multiplied through us and around us. Well, if you go to Romans chapter 5, I love this verse. Romans chapter 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. See, the Bible said here, God's love has been poured out in every one of our hearts. Have you ever said, well, and we're going to talk about this a little bit here. See, you and I don't have a good excuse. See, the Bible says that God's love has been poured out in each and every one of our hearts, okay? You may be saying to yourself this morning, this all sounds good, but it's not working in my life. The only reason we don't believe it'll work in our life is because we don't understand love, God's love. I have here, if you're taking notes real quick, there's four Greek words for love. That when we say love in English, there's four Greek words. Number one, the first Greek word for love is called storge. S-T-O-R-G-E. Storge. That means love. And this is a love between family members. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure this happens a lot. Gage says to Maggie, Maggie, I love you. Okay. Oh, maybe he doesn't say that much. Okay. What, you know, in, in our in our. English, we're just saying, I love you. But if you would speak Greek, you would say, Maggie, I storge you. And she would know that is a family love towards each other. The second kind of love is called eros, E-R-O-S. This love is, is, erot, is erotic or sexual love. Okay, that's what that means in the Greek. The third is phileo. And what town do we get from? What city in America? Philadelphia, Phileo, the city of brotherly love. This is brotherly love or a friendship love. Maybe this would be Gage saying to JD, JD, I love you. 
Okay? And what you're saying is, I, I have a brotherly love for you. Okay? And then the last word for love is agape. Is agape. A-G-A-P-E. And this is the God kind of love. Okay? And it's spiritual, and it's selfless, and it's sacrificial. So if you'd go up and say to somebody, I love you with, a, with agape love, you're saying, I'm going to be, it's a sacrificial love. And you know what I know parents generally have? Parents have agape love. You never know how much your parents sacrifice for you until you become a parent. I don't know about you. Know, remember you thought, you know, mom and dad, they just don't have much of a life. You know, their life is revolved around taking care of me. You know what I'm talking about. And then all of a sudden you get married and you have kids. And you start thinking, man, this is hard. Man, I mean, then you start thinking, you know what? Mom and dad did this for me too. That was a selfless love. That they had your best interest at heart. See, God's love isn't based first and only on emotions. Because see, if God's love was based on emotions, you know what to do? It would change. You know, I talk with people sometimes that have been married and maybe they're having, they're having marital problems. And the first thing they'll tell me maybe is, I don't love them anymore. Well, many times, you know what that love was based on was emotions. And you know what? Emotions come and go. But really, what God is saying, what love is, love is not emotions first. Love is a decision. When Meryl and I got married almost 41 years ago, and I told her, I love you, what I was really saying is, Marilyn, I'm making a decision to be your helpmate. Because our emotions will come and go, won't they? Some days you may feel like you're in love. Other days you may not. But you know what, folks? See, feelings will lie to us. They change. But I made a decision to take care of my wife. I made a decision to love her. And we need to realize, see, God isn't driven by emotions. That's why he doesn't say, oh, I don't love you today. I do love you today. No. And Meryl and I had made a decision many, many years ago. We always said we would never tell each other, I don't love you. We have said before, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like what you're doing. I'm okay with that. But this is how it works, saints, that have been married are married. Maybe you get in an argument with your spouse. And your spouse says, I don't love you anymore. And that sticks with you. And then all of a sudden, when things get better, they come back. And you know what they tell you? I'm sorry. But you know what? All of a sudden, the devil has planted a seed in your thought about your spouse. They don't love me anymore. And so then all of a sudden, you make things right. You say, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. You say, okay. And then maybe, maybe three months later, you get in another argument. And you know what you're thinking? They don't love me, do they? They told me one other time. And so then that little seed of, of doubt starts to grow into a little tree, into a weed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because that was planted. See, you and I need to know, with, especially your spouse, you love them unconditionally. You love them however they are. You may not like what they do, and then you can live with the not likes. But don't let love ever be questioned in your relationship. Because we should, or else it will start to deteriorate. See, agape love, or God's love, looks out for the best interest of others. Regardless of the cost to itself. I love this because God's love doesn't always say yes. It knows when to say no. When it's your best interest for him to say no. You know what? Kids, there's Brody. I'll see him. You know, sometimes your mom and dad tell you no because they love you. Say amen. Okay, I just, uh, we got it on tape now, okay? You know, so many times we think, well, you know, if you love me, you let me do it. No, sometimes if you love me, you won't let him do it. And you know what? Sometimes God does tell us no because he has our best interest at heart. And we need to realize when we don't understand it, but if the Lord tells us no, we need to say, you know what? I can live with that because I know God has my best interest at heart. You know what? The last thing, you know, our, our, little, our little granddaughters, Emma and Alice, you know, in Denmark, they, they raise kids a whole lot different. They really do in life. But you, they don't, they, a lot of them don't think you should tell your kids no to anything. And I found out the only people that know how to say no in Denmark are kids five and under, okay? You'll t they say nay, nay. That's Danish for no. You figure that out real quick. Hallelujah, okay? But you know what? Sometimes you got to tell your kids no. Not because you're trying to ruin their life. Not because you're trying to take anything. But you have their best 
interest at heart. And maybe you'll figure that out later on in life. See, when, uh, when this is, uh, who then is, uh, I have here, who then is this God kind of love directed at? I want to, we're going to close here and we'll go through this pretty quick. Over in Matthew chapter 4, who is this love directed at? Because love is a big thing. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're going to talk about over in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 27. Who is this love supposed to be directed at first? We're going to go in verse 27. This is the words of Jesus. It says uh, in Matthew, i got to find it, Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Then Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So we need to make a decision to love God first. You've heard me tell you many times, God gets a 10 in my life. He's the only one. Maryland gets the 9. Yep, because you know what? I'm supposed to love no one before God. And my family gets an 8. My kids don't get in front of my wife. You know why? My children are a result of my love for her. Okay? They can't be put... You know, when Marilyn and I got married, the Bible says her and I became one, not my kids and me became one. And it doesn't mean that I don't love my kids, but I have to keep them in the priority. Kids are not supposed to be equal with the spouse. They're not. Okay? Because someday, you know what? They're going to leave. And I've told you this before. I've seen it happen so many times. People have been married 25 years, and when the last kid leaves the house, they end up getting a divorce because they didn't spend time with each other. They built their whole lives around their kids. I got news for you. Those kids are blessings, but your life should not revolve around them. Your life is not to be their soccer mommy or their basketball daddy. Your life and your wife's life or your husband's life is supposed to take priority all that. Sometimes you might have to tell your kids, no, you don't get to go and do that. I know they're going to throw a fit. If you love me, you'll let me go. I got news for you. I love your father, your mother more. And that's what we're going to work on the most. Okay? Now, it's getting a little quiet in here, hallelujah, okay? But <laughs> So number one, we're supposed to love God first. Now, let's just go down two more verses. And then Jesus said, the second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So number one, we need to make a decision to love God first. Number two, we need to make a decision to love our neighbor second. And now let's go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to go down in verse 43. Matthew 5, 43. And folks, I'm just giving you words from the Bible. Okay? I'm just giving you Bible words. And you know what? You can receive it and apply it, or you can reject it and say it's not true. But I tell you what, this Bible works, okay? I've always told people, if you and I want Bible results, then we got to get on the Bible system. See, I think what frustrates many churchgoers, in America especially, is they get frustrated because they, they don't think the Bible is working in their life. And they're going to church, but I say, no, just going to church doesn't mean everything. Do you understand? You and I, if we want this Bible to work in our lives, we got to get on the Bible system and apply its principles in our life. Then they will work. Over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. So you're supposed to love God first. You're supposed to love your neighbor second. Look at what it says in verse 20, uh, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So you know what God's love is? You love him first. You love your neighbor second. And third, you got to love your enemies. Hello. You know, I remember talking to somebody in marital counseling. And, and the guy came up to me and says, I don't love my wife anymore. I said, okay, well... I want him to know what his base his love was on, okay? And it was feelings. But I said, you have to love her. He said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. If you're going to tell me you're a Christian, you believe in the Bible, you have to love her. At that point, their marriage had been very cantankerous, and he considered her an enemy. So I take him to the Scripture. You have to love your enemy. Wow. You know, sometimes this Bible thing and Jesus thing really gets in our lives, doesn't it? Hallelujah. I said, you know what? You have to love her. 
Because the Bible says you got to love God, you got to love your neighbor, and you got to love your enemy. And at this point in your life, your marriage, your situation is very cantankerous, and you view her or him, you could say whatever it is, as an enemy, and God says you still have to love them. How are you and I going to love somebody like that? It says in Romans 5.5 5, how that God has, has, through the Holy Spirit, has poured in his love into our hearts. See, we all have that God kind of love in our hearts. Come on. We all have it. And if God's put it in us, then we can use it. Now, maybe you don't feel like loving them. I understand that. But love is not a feeling first. Love is a decision. Let me ask you this. Who are you going to believe? Your feelings are God's word. If you have to love your enemy. Who are you going to believe? I promise you, your feelings are going to come and go. God's word is going to stay forever. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will remain. See, folks, as I've mentioned previously, sacrificial love isn't based on feelings, but a determined act of the will and a resolve to put the welfare of others in front of yourself. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. What was the first fruit of the Spirit there? Love. And you know what? I'm almost of the proponent that maybe the joy and the peace and all these other things, maybe there's only one fruit of the Spirit. And the rest of them come out of love. Does that, mean, does that make sense? Maybe. I'm not saying it is, but maybe. Because I promise you, if you and I don't have love, you know what we're not going to have? Joy. We're not going to have peace. We're not going to have goodness. We're not going to have long-suffering. But if you and I have love, I think all these others come right out of love. See, next week, we're going to talk about the third candle, okay? And next week, we're going to find out why the third candle is the pink candle, not the other purple candle, Okay? But I want you to know this week, I believe God is going to give you and I great opportunities to exercise love. Now, you're like me, maybe you're not looking forward to that. Hallelujah, okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Marvin. <laughs> I hope you're still laughing next week, Marvin. Hallelujah, okay? <laughs> He's going to give us opportunities to love. You know what? Because sometimes we're going to look in their best interest. And we're, look, and we're going to love as member visionary. We're not going to see them maybe as they are. We're going to see them in how they can be. And we're going to love them. And when we love them, you know what's going to happen? Now, this is what I love about the Bible. In Luke chapter 6, verse 30, it says, Given will be given back to you. You know, that's not talking just about money. See, I think if you and I give love, love will be given back to us. Good measure, press down, shake together, running over. And so, you know what? Next week on your praise report cards, I want you to fill out some of those next week. You tell me how God's love won out this week in a situation in your life, okay? Because I believe God, see, God just doesn't give us his word on a Sunday morning to say, wasn't that nice? No, he gives us his word so we can apply it next week. And I think we're going to do that, amen? Why don't we stand up, please? Lord, I thank you and I praise you for your word. The Bible says your word will not return void, but will accomplish all that you send it out to accomplish. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for the wonderful people here at Christ the King today. Lord, you told us, number one, we've got to love you first. We've got to love our neighbors second. We've got to love our enemies. Lord, those things are not easy, but because you have shed your love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we can do this, Lord God. Together we can do this. And Lord, we're going to make a difference in the lives of maybe a coworker, maybe a neighbor, Lord God, maybe a, a, maybe a spouse. Lord, we're going to make a difference because your love has made a difference in our lives. And I pray, Lord God, for the, for the victories that we're going to experience this week. And all God's people said, amen.